You ready? Oh, okay, you guys, I am honored to be here. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Katie Buckingham. I'm our curator here at Museum of Glass. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Katherine Gray. Um, Kathy is the uh, director of the art program at California State University San Bernardino. Uh, and you probably know her as resident evaluator of Netflix reality series Blown Away. Uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, it's totally a wild ride. Uh, we're three seasons in and loving every minute. Um, but while you guys may know Kathy that way, the way we know her here is as one of the women whose sheer glass blowing skill uh, was responsible for breaking the glass ceiling and inspiring you know, generations of women to join what was largely an all male movement uh, in the 1960s and you know, centuries before. So it's been a real honor to watch you work here this week. Um, she's here as the result of our grand prize Coney Award from last year's auction. So all of our artists give a piece to support what we do here uh, in our annual auction. And we award one artist a grand prize for the technical ability of their piece. So that's why Kathy's here. But um, we are honored to have her here. She's going to tell you a little bit about her work. Uh, and we're going to throw a phone number up here. We're going to do a Q&A after Kathy's talk. And you'll be able to text us your questions. So uh, we'll leave that number up on the top of the screen here in a minute. And, uh, you you can text us. <laughs> it's not my number either. <laughs> Take it away, Kathy. Thank you so much, Katie, for that lovely um, introduction. And uh, thank you all for being here and coming down to the museum and uh, seeing us at, at work, which but, but really more often than not kind of feels like play. Um, so like Katie said, um, I'm a glass artist. I've been blowing glass probably for like 30 some years at this point. I also am an educator and uh, that's been kind of taking more of my time lately, my, my day job as it were. Um, so this is a real treat for me to come here and be able to work so intensively with such a great crew of um, glass blowers and artists here at the museum. Um, and I'm super thrilled with what we've been making and, uh, and the fun we've been having and the gossip we get to catch up on. So that's also a big part of being here. Um, so I'm going to show some images of work. Um, I'm not going all the way back to the beginning, um, but maybe some sort of more kind of pivotal pieces or if any of you, um, you know, follow glass in any capacity or visit other museums, maybe you might have seen some of, some of my work. But um, one thing that happened to me after, you know, living here in the Seattle in the Northwest for a number of years and then moving to Los Angeles to um, take up this teaching job, um, I remember getting a call about being invited to be in an exhibition at the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Virginia. And they were going to um, underwrite um, whatever it is I wanted to fabricate for the exhibition, you know, to a, a certain dollar amount. And that was the first, and actually so far only time, hopefully not the last time that that's ever happened for me, but it was really a big um, game changer in terms of what I could think about making. And I went to the museum and, you know, they were very open about, you know, please be inspired by whatever is in our museum. We wanted something to kind of, uh, you know, relate or correspond or have a conversation with things in their collection. They have a big glass collection, but, you know, it's a museum. They have painting, sculpture, photo, things from all eras. They had this amazing collection of, like, Wedgwood China, which I kind of found kind of fascinating, too. And I left there not really knowing what was going to be sort of the, the, the trigger for what was, I was going to end up fabricating. But I went home and started looking at some of the photos I took of their, their glass collection. And so that's the photo that's on the left that you see. And you know, they've actually since redesigned their um, galleries, so it doesn't look like this anymore. But I remember looking at this image and thinking like, man, there's so much glass from so many different eras and, and ge geographic regions, but it was really hard to make any of it out because it was all behind glass. So there's all these reflections from like the vitrines and the panels of glass in front of cases and stuff like that. So in this image you see, you know, some Islamic glass in the back, some like English cut crystal, Maybe there's some like Roman glass in a reflection somewhere. And that really kind of intrigued me that you couldn't really see the glass because of the glass. Um, and it turned out that um, Norfolk is right near Jamestown, Virginia, which is where the first Europeans kind of made a permanent settlement in the very early 1600s. Um, and one of the first industries they thought they wanted to try to 
begin in the new world was glass making. You know, they arrived and, you know, at that time in Northern Europe, glass making was all fueled by wood, you know, so glass houses would often sort of sprout up in, um, you know, forested areas. The glass makers would cut down the trees and burn them to fuel the furnaces. And then, you know, when that area was depleted, they would move somewhere else. And, you know, that's not a really great environmental record for glass making and kind of continues. Glass making still, I think, is, is problematic, but certainly not the worst offender. But I thought it was kind of um, a little dispiriting that people arrive at this new continent and see it full of trees and think, okay, great, let's start cutting them down. You know, and they didn't, you know, think about um, how they would maybe change their ways at all. Um, so anyways, what I ended up arriving at was kind of trying to reverse that idea of making glass out of trees, but making trees out of glass. So if you, and maybe at this distance you don't really need to squint your eyes a little bit, but you can see there's sort of these tree forms on the shelves. Um, so this was actually all made out of uh, glass from thrift stores and um, uh, eBay and stuff like that. So I would just basically go into a thrift store and buy all of the green and brown and clear drinking glasses that they had, and then um, arrange them on the shelves, you know, to kind of make these sort of tree forms. And hidden in there are some glasses that have, you know, some um, birds that are enameled on them, you know, so around the base there's some um, mushrooms. They're a little bit kind of foreshortened, they're not fully three-dimensional, and that has to kind of do with that original image of, of all of those, that history of glass kind of being on that compressed picture plane. And then the green and brown glasses are also all surrounded by clear glasses. So again, kind of referencing sort of those clear glass windows that were in the, in the glass ex exhibition um, or displays in this museum. So this piece is called Forest Glass, as you can read, which was, is also the name of um, you know, the kind of, that style of glass that I was describing from you know, early Renaissance times, you know, from Northern Europe, where the glass was usually lightly tinted blues and browns and greens just because of the impurities and the local um, raw materials that were, they were using, but definitely um, in areas where you know, uh, wood was sort of their main source of fuel. So even though that piece didn't involve any glass blowing, um, I was still you know, blowing glass pretty regularly and was kind of exploring these themes. So um, some of these pieces um, kind of sort of tie in, you know, I think like a lot of artists, you sort of get these sort of curiosities or these themes that you start to, to explore um, and you keep exploring them until you come on to something else or, um, or maybe you just find it's a really, you've struck a rich vein and you kind of stick with it. Um, I call these pieces table topiaries. They are, um, uh, you know, cake plates and stackable containers. They're actually based on topiaries at the Palace of Versailles and they are made out of uh, recycled glass that we use at the, at the school where I teach, and we just throw some colorants, some chemicals in there to remelt it and make these kind of tints of browns and greens. So I'm sort of thinking about making green glass, greenery, in a greener way. And this idea of, you know, arranging glass on shelves like this, um, you know, I think is also kind of inspired by going to thrift stores a lot and seeing lots of glass on shelves and how they get arranged, sometimes by color, size, or uh, function. Um, but I also, you know, with that forest glass piece, I noticed that it was almost like stained glass when the light is behind, you know, coming through the, um, the drinking glasses in that case, that it really kind of illuminates the way stained glass does. And, you know, it's, then that's kind of, you know, a kind of glass that I don't do at all, a technique that um, really isn't part of my um, repertoire, but I do love the associations of like light coming through colored glass. Um, this piece I call the break because, um, for a couple of reasons, um, and it might not be super clear in the slide, but the shelves kind of come up and over ever so slightly, and at the top there's some white pictures. Um, and these are all actually hand-blown, um, uh, made by me, but I was really trying to make them look a little bit anonymous, like a little bit like they could have been made in a, a factory. And uh, it's 
inspired by, by being a teacher um, and realizing you know, that I had all of this kind of knowledge that people have shared with me over the years about glass blowing and life, and, and then trying to be a conduit and sort of dispensing all of that knowledge. Like I didn't want it to sort of, sort of stay with me. I wanted it to, you know, to be dispersed. Um, but it also was inspired by moving to Southern California in my, you know, I think it was mid, mid to late 30s. And, um, and then deciding it was a good time to learn how to surf and not being a strong swimmer and not liking being in cold water and not liking getting up at the crack of dawn really made absolutely no sense. Um, but uh, it, I have enjoyed it. It gave me a whole new appreciation for teaching beginners how to blow glass because I feel like when you teach beginners glass blowing, they're like, I want to make a goblet. And you're like, easy, easy, you know, that'll come. And, you know, I'd be paddling out in the water and see people like catch waves and like, I want to do that tomorrow. <laughs> um, and there was definitely times where I was out in the water and you kind of see like a wave kind of breaking and I'm, you know, the waves are way bigger than my appropriate or inappropriate skill level. And you're just like paddling like crazy to kind of get over the wave before it comes crashing down on you. So the spout to me is really evocative of that sense of a wave and that sort of pouring out, but also even just, again, like that sort of dis dispersal of knowledge or there's, you know, the way the energy of the wave kind of disseminates as it, as it breaks and crashes. <clears throat> um, getting back to sort of thrift stores, I've kind of, I've taken out some uh, uh, slides that, you know, kind of are some establishing shots, uh, but I do, when I, I'm always amazed when you go into some, you know, pretty squalid thrift stores, but everything's arranged like in the colors of the rainbow, and it looks so pretty. Um, and I love rainbows for lots of reasons. Um, and uh, this piece is called Broken Bow. Um, I forget, I'm not seeing it down here. You can read all of that, so I'll stop. Oh, maybe you don't see it either I, um, because of the transcription. Never mind, it is on the slide. Um, uh, yeah, so this is just solid glass. Uh, ar arches um, that just are kind of piled together. <clears throat> this is another piece, again, playing with rainbows and, you know, that idea of stained glass, of light, um, passing through the glass. Uh, you know, the one thing that always sort of bothered me a little bit about stained glass in churches was that there was this sort of um, understanding that, you know, light and knowledge were coming from the heavens above and coming down through the windows and educating, you know, the populace or the congregation. And I kind of wanted to flip that and have, you know, the light coming from below and, you know, coming from the population or just coming from earth and passing through glass and going up um, and, and making sort of this really spectral, watery kind of looking rainbow. So these are all hand-blown glass. This is you know, again, kind of generic shapes that if they were just in clear glass, you probably wouldn't spend any time looking at, you wouldn't think twice about them, but when you see them in these different colors, you start to kind of look at them a little bit differently. So this is a piece, and you know, I've had the amazing honor of having residencies here a few times, and I'm, I'm not sure if this was the last time or maybe even the time before I was working on this piece and was able to um, have this incredible team help me execute some of these pieces. Um, I started this in uh, 2016, and um, you know, it was kind of early in the year I started kind of thinking about this, and uh, you know, I love those when people have windows, those greenhouse windows, or even just a plain window, but they have filled it with, you know, bottles and vases and transparent glass. Um, you know, and it looks so, so beautiful, and it also kind of you know, it kind of makes me chuckle a little bit thinking about like glass in a greenhouse and thinking about, oh, is the glass gonna grow or, you know, multiply kind of thing. And, and I'm, I'll um, just say outright, I don't want to offend anybody, but I was kind of thinking about Donald Trump um, run for presidency at this point and thinking how something seems kind of innocuous and benign, but then as it um, gathers steam or proliferates, it becomes kind of, you know, a malevolent force. And so in this case, like the glass is all black and dense and kind of, you know, makes the window not so functional. It kind of makes you realize that, you know, trans transparency and clarity is something that we could easily take for granted. Um, 
it's also, I was using black glass also as a reference to obsidian, which is a naturally occurring uh, geological glass that's usually black and very crude and dense as kind of also this um, reference to, you know, lack of refinement or even sort of a lack of a, you know, a civilizing presence. Uh, a, f a few years ago, as I was starting to think about turning 50 and thinking about, um, uh, you know, that maybe I'm not going to be blowing glass for forever, um, even though I was here at an, at an event a few months ago, or a few weeks ago rather, with a um, very well-known Italian glass blowing maestro, Lino Telepietra, who has kind of retired, and he's 88, but I think he only retired like within the last year or two, and I sort of was like, oh my god. Could I imagine like blowing glass for like, I don't know, another 30 years? And it just it seems um, hard to fathom. And I started kind of thinking about the kinds of feelings and experiences and sensations that you have when you're in the hot shop as a glass blower that really make you feel warm, like kind of literally, but also figuratively. And so these are the series of hearths, it's kind of stylized hearths just made out of clear glass and thinking about. Um, you know, when you're sitting around a campfire kind of thing and having that sort of warm glow, um, or, you know, that warmth kind of emanating from the fire. Um, you know, very similar to being in front of a glory hole and sometimes equally as one-sided, like the front of you could be like really, really warm, but the back of you is kind of freezing kind of thing. Um, the black glass is also, in this case, um, and this sort of came to me later, I was thinking about, or realized that, you know, campfires were, and sitting around a campfire was sort of one way you would sort of commune with your friends and just sort of, you know, tell stories and, um, ha you know, have that kind of camaraderie. Whereas and now I feel like black glass is like our devices, you know, these things that are the new kind of campfire that we're, that's the way we all kind of communicate and talk to each other. Um, this piece is made out of uranium glass, so it's another kind of hearth piece that um, this is what it looks like under just ambient light and then under UV light, um, really kind of fluoresces like that. Uh, it's pretty kind of amazing, but hard to display <laughs> when you need total darkness and, and a UV light. But um, uh, part of what my motivation for this piece was the fact that um, and I think it's here in Washington State. I can't remember where, but it's maybe in the southeast corner somewhere, and maybe it's built. I don't know. I remember hearing about a factory that was being built to melt glass that was going to be specifically to store nuclear waste. So the uranium was going to be kind of encased in glass and then encased in concrete and stainless steel and buried somewhere, something like that. So some other pieces that kind of remind me of kind of being in the hot shop here. This is called uh, Sun Study. So it's just a bunch, it's very small. This piece is only maybe like seven inches in diameter, but it's just got a bunch of uh, little hemispheres of glass. You can't see all of them through here. Um, it's actually just on clear acrylic. It looks black just because of the angle of the photo. Um, but it sort of, you know, mimics to me like either a sunset or kind of looking into the sun, which is how we often kind of feel like when we're looking into the glory hole. And uh, at one point I started working with a perfumist um, to try to generate the smells that are pretty common and particular to working in a hot shop. And so for those of you who've been here or have seen us working or maybe have seen glass blowing other, way, other places, um, you know that we use um, a pad of wet newspaper to kind of shape glass at certain stages. Um, we wear a protective sleeve on our arms. Um, there's beeswax on the benches for lubricating the tools. And then these uh, things that you see the handles of in these buckets are just called blocks, but it's a wood kind of ladly looking thing that we use for shaping the glass, particularly when it first comes out of the furnace. And um, every time you use any of those things or if they start to get hot or burning, there's like a, a smell associated with them. So um, it was fascinating working with a perfumist. I thought there was like crazy arcana around like glass blowing techniques, but it is nothing compared to working with a perfumer. 
And, um, and she wouldn't just, you know, I'd bring her like a block, and especially if you leave the blocks in the water and don't change the water for a long time, there is a very particular smell that's not terrible, but it's not great either. And, but she wouldn't, um, you know, it wasn't like she was sort of scraping a little bit off and kind of distilling that into a tincture. She was actually like culling from all kinds of other things and kind of mixing them down, um, you know, letting it mature for like a few weeks and then um, would, you know, make adjustments. So I would kind of meet with her like every couple of months and like smell some things and be like, yep, you're on the right track or, you know, way off. So in this particular piece, there's uh, a motion sensor. So when people walk up, it would just sort of diffuse a little bit of the scent into these sort of bottle shaped things. And you would put your face over the top. So not all of the scents were just sort of billowing out into the room at all times. Uh, this is a sound piece where, well, one day I would just make a bunch of these um, little tumblers, uh, sort of a little straight-sided tumbler, kind of like this thing, but instead of the ribs being spiraling around the glass, they were just vertical. And, you know, that when you're using the tools, the jacks in particular, like over the sides of it, it really makes um, a sound. And then sort of like the more noticeable that sound is, like the better job you've done on kind of keeping those ribs. It's sort of a little glass maker thing. You don't want to melt those ribs out too much. And so at any rate, I had little mics, contact mics on like the, you know, the tweezers, the jacks, shears. Um, I guess that was kind of it. Um, and just recorded sort of the soundtrack of all of the tools touching the glass uh, through the process of making one of these cups. And um, so when you're in the uh, walk up to this piece, you kind of can put your ear to it and kind of eavesdrop on this kind of intimate conversation between the tools and the glass. <clears throat> this piece kind of started me on uh, the series that I've kind of been continuing on here today. Um, and also uh, there's a piece on display right now in one of the, in the gallery called Out of the Blue. Um, these uh, shapes represent the glory hole on the right and the furnace opening on the left. And these are basically the same diameter and the same positioning as they are in the studio at my school where I work a lot. Um, they're kind of close together, much farther apart. They're much farther apart here in a different configuration, but our studio is pretty compressed, so it's, a, it's tight quarters. And I made these panels in a way that flat glass used to be made, which is making a cylinder, um, cut, cut both ends so they're open, and cut a slit down one side. And then um, this is, that part is all done after you've made the cylinder and it's cooled down. But then you put it back in an oven and heat it up, and it slumps out, opens out into a flat sheet. So this, you know, for many uh, hundreds of years was how flat glass was made, very la labor intensive. Um, and, and you know, and you get you know irregularities in the glass because it's uh, handmade. So I made these and cut these shapes out, and then was just kind of playing around with like this iridescent coating, or starting to dabble in it and put that on these pieces. So not so obvious in a still image, but when you kind of walk across these pieces, it kind of changes colors and goes from orange to yellowy gold to green, and just kind of looks like it has a life of its own. And you know, this the making these putting the coating on these pieces was sort of um, you know I was making this work all for a particular show, but I kind of filed that technique away because I really loved how that iridescence looked and wanted and uh, you know wanted to come back to it. Oh, this is the thing. Uh, this is another piece from the same series. This actually isn't glass, but it is a pad of beeswax that um, you see on the benches here. Um, I peeled it off of our bench at school and got it cast in bronze and then gold plated. And so, and this pedestal is actually the same dimensions as the t little tool table here that's beside the bench. Um, and again, just kind of memorializing um, being a, a, uh, the life of a glass blower, I guess. Uh, there's a little bit of an inside joke. It is called wax. We sometimes say wax the jacks, um, but Crazily, there's actually a glass educator named Jack Wax. And I had my people get in touch with his people to see if he would be okay if I called this piece that. <laughs> and 
I also took, this also, not glass, is uh, just a banner, and I took all of the non-glass books off my bookshelf and kind of crammed as many of my glass books onto one shelf as I could. And part of that is, you know, thinking, you know, I think all of this stuff is infused with nostalgia, even though I'm still kind of an active, relatively active glass blower, but thinking about just looking at books and how much um, that had, has been like a huge influence on me and looking, you know, for inspiration or what other people are doing or how, um, you know, things used to be done. Um, so I kind of, you know, was sort of trying to isolate like my own canon of, of glass history. Um, you know, glass as an art form hasn't been around nearly as long, say, as, you know, sculpture and painting, architecture, any of those things. So there's not, you know, the same depth of writing and literature about it, but, um, you know, it's, it's getting there. So I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about um, some pieces that I co collaborate on with a couple of different artists. And one primarily I collaborate on with, with Nancy Callan, who is uh, another uh, glass artist, an incredible glass blower. She was actually here the last two days because we were um, continuing on a collaboration, a different collaboration. But we made a bunch of these pieces that kind of riff on the idea of clowns. Um, this was an exhibition that was at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art in the summer 2021. Um, uh, and it's um, very slowly touring around with like long gaps between venues, um, but it will see the light of day again. Um, but you know, glass clowns and were kind of a thing in Venice at some point, or they kind of still are. Um, and early ones were like really exquisite, showed a lot of finesse and a lot of uh, technical chops. Now, not so much, you know, they're much more kind of cheaper tchotchkes made for like the kind of souvenir market. But, you know, we both kind of work in what's often called like a Venetian style of glass making. And, you know, her way of working or what she's really known for is all these patterns with uh, cane, these glass colored rods that kind of make these patterns on the panels. Um, and I, uh, although I don't do this work as much anymore, for a long time did a lot of stuff with bits and frou-frou, like little flowery things and candelabra with lots of little handles and stuff like that. So clowns seem to be sort of, a, given their history with, with uh, this token of being Venetian, um, seem like a good place for us to kind of combine our, our skills. So these are just some examples from um, this body of work. It's super fun to work with Nancy. Um, we had a blast when she was just here. And you know, we've always loved working together, so we are kind of continuing to collaborate on um, some new pieces as well. Um, kind of incorporating, again, some of her kind of cane techniques, but now also kind of incorporating um, some of this iridescence that, that gets applied to the pieces. Um, and I think I have a piece in a minute here. Oh, that's weird. I don't know why that looks like it's on glitter. <laughs> but anyways, um, uh, so yeah, so when I started playing around with this iridescence, I kind of realized, and it was a little bit unusual, it's an industrial process, so I actually take it somewhere and they apply it. And it felt a little weird as somebody that's been kind of a maker all their life, or think of myself as such for like this really integral part of the process to be done by somebody else. So I really had to kind of switch gears and really kind of think about how can I make things that will really sort of capitalize and highlight this process. So some of these, um, and this piece was actually made here um, at a, what, on a pr prior residency. Um, you know, it looks really good on like these really kind of curvy shapes where there's kind of combinations of concave and convex. I love, um, the way the glass really starts to feel more like a skin rather than a membrane. Um, you know, I also um, was kind of playing around with the ideas of, you know, because it's not something that I do, it seemed like uncomfortably easy, you know, like to just kind of make forms and get this coating applied. So I've also been kind of just playing with things, uh, you know, how I develop the forms are things about that go wrong in the hot shop sometimes. Um, and not that I've got like the greatest examples here, but um, you know, 
this, well, this is the same piece, and you can kind of get a sense of the color shift that happens on these pieces when you move around them. Um, but something like this form, for instance, is a kind of a double-walled bowl. So it, it starts as a big sphere, essentially, and then we like suck it in. So we'll heat the front half and suck it in, so you have like this inside and outside surface. Um, and then it's kind of shaped and dolled up a little bit more. Um, but also kind of like a little bit of a, you know, beginnerish kind of move to like make a bowl. Um, you know, bowls typically can be kind of a trickier, to make a nice bowl anyways can be a little bit trickier. Um, so in my mind it was sort of like two wrongs making a right here of just, you know, using this, the sucking in technique and then the iridescent coating. So I often have kind of played with like, you know, when things kind of go wrong, but, you know, trying to do them well when things go wrong. And um, uh, if you saw some of the pieces that we just were making earlier, these kind of cylinders, but then I'll torch an area and kind of tweak it. That can sometimes happen when you're making a nice crisp form or get something too hot that the glass just kind of wants to fold and wrinkle. Um, these are just some very simple shapes. I just kind of spin out flat. Uh, I mean, I make some cuts so they don't spin out into a disc, but other kinds of shapes, and then kind of fold them over again. And I know it looks kind of strange in the image, but especially in the one on the right, where it looks like that bluey purple indigo color is glowing, that's really what it looks like in real life. And sometimes you're sort of looking at it and you're not totally sure whether you're really seeing the color there or if it's some optical effect. Um, there's something that happens when there's this sort of shadowing, like when the coating, oh, I got a laser pointer, I think. Oh, oh no. Oh God, what did I just do? Never mind. All right, never mind. Um, anyways, when the, the iridescent coating is applied, if there's sort of something that kind of comes over it, there's some sort of shadowing effect that happens underneath it. Here's an, a, a collaboration, a newer one with uh, Nancy that I was talking about earlier. So um, again, this is uh, a particular kind of cane or marini technique is actually the more appropriate term um, where we've done that technique that I described a minute ago, making a cylinder, opened it up to this flat panel. We've used what a really hard glass that doesn't want to like melt and move to make um, and it's surrounded by a softer colored glass that does. So when you blow it out, you can kind of see parts of it aren't really like melted in and it gives it like this amazing texture. And then um, that rainbow kind of effect is from the iridescence. I also um, collaborate now and again with my partner, Eric Hipsch. And these were pieces we made kind of at the very beginning of the pandemic when, you know, every play, everywhere closed down. Um, you know, I couldn't really work with people, but obviously he and I were in a bubble, so I was like, all right, let's make some stuff. We had a furnace full of glass, so we just started making these solid uh, candelabra and using uh, glass powders that are sifted on and then have kind of a reductive quality um, so they get a little bit silvery. We also like fabricated all the little candle holder things too, so those are all gold and silver plated. So that was kind of a, f a fun project. And then, as Katie mentioned, I also am on a Netflix show called Blown Away. Um, this is from um, season one. And we're in a couple, a few weeks, I'm actually going to head to where we film to film season four, which is kind of blowing my mind. I kind of felt like when we wrapped up filming after season one, you know, they, f they film and then it's like, nine months at the minimum before the show is finished, editing, going through all the editing and stuff like that. So you sort of forget that it's even out there. And, you know, I think we all just sort of thought like, oh, that was cool. That was a fun thing. And I think all of us were really surprised how, um, uh, how much, how popular the show became. But I'm, in retrospect, I'm kind of surprised I'm surprised because, you know, places like this where like, people like yourselves come and just want to stay and watch glass blowing. Like I think a lot of glass blowers know like this is pretty fascinating stuff to watch. But um, you know, n on Netflix, you know, you can, there's like thousands and thousands of shows. And I think they actually even delayed um, the release of the sh season one because 
Saturday Night Live like made a joke about Netflix and how much content they have on their on their platform, and I think they got really self-conscious about it. So they didn't want us to come out with a reality glass blowing show right away. Um, but anyways, it's been like a really amazing um, uh, side hustle, but also a, a great thing I feel like for me for the field in that how much awareness it has brought to the field. Um, you know, and like even glass artists that haven't been on the show have, you know, been able to kind of make a better living because so many more people now know what they do or the effort and the work that goes into it or, you know, if they open their studio up, if people want to come and take classes or try to make something, you know, after they've seen the show, you know, as like another kind of income stream or something like that. So that for me has been amazing. Like this was certainly never on my radar that, um, you know, that I was going to ever be on TV in this kind of capacity, but it's been really great to, for my parents to see that. <laughs> and hopefully for other glass blowers too, um, that they see like, oh, that's what my kid does. And, um, and they're making a living at it, so that's great too. So that's my last slide. I'm happy to entertain and answer any questions. Um, or if, any, if there's any on the text. And you can text them to me too at the number that's on the screen. Um, our first question, uh, somebody from the 775 area code, thank you, uh, was wondering about the life experiences that drew you to glass. Life experiences that drew me to glass. Uh, you know, the main one I think really was just as an art, art school student, I had this vague idea growing up that I wanted to be an artist. I didn't really know what that meant. There was no artists in my family or in my life um, when I was a kid. Um, and, you know, I would see people carrying those big black portfolio cases, you know, and I was like, oh, that's so cool. But I didn't really like drawing. I didn't really like painting. I just didn't really know what some of the options were. And I remember walking into the glass studio um, where I went to undergrad and was like, that looks cool. And, um, you know, I had this vague idea that maybe I wanted to design furniture and lighting. So I thought, well, maybe it'd be good to know a little bit about working with glass. And so I took a glass blowing class. And that's been the most formative. I love this question. Um, somebody is seeking advice for convincing their own parents to let them go to art school. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the right crowd for that question. Oh my gosh, no kidding. Yeah, my mom was really supportive. Work on your mom. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, you know, there's, I think people think that there's just no money to be made if you're an artist. And that's, you know, sure, there's people that make like a ton of money and there's some people that really struggle, but there are lots of artists that make a decent living um, doing lots of different kinds of things. And I feel like one thing about an arts education is it really prepares you for anything and everything. You know, you have to think about, you, you have to be self-directed and self-motivated, um, which, you know, will serve you well no matter what you end up doing. Um, you have to be resourceful. Um, and you, get, you just get to have like amazing life experiences and, and that is worth way much more, way, so much more than like a high paying job, in my humble opinion. Mine too. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions out there in the non cell phone holding audience members? Okay, I have another one oh, from, one right here. oh, great. Where? <laughs> I, I, uh, the question was where I went to undergrad. I went to Ontario College of Art uh, in Toronto. They don't have, actually have a glass blowing program anymore. And then I went to Rhode Island School of Design for my master's, my MFA. I hear everybody tittering. You just, I feel like everybody just realized I'm Canadian. <laughs> it, was like, <laughs> it was my out and about. And <laughs> Um, I have a question about whether it's harder for you to make big or small things. Oh, way harder for me to make big things. Really? Yeah, yeah, way Why? harder. Yeah, I'm just, I mean, I don't make big things that often. And um, maybe if I made them more often, it would be easier. But it's easy, and to just dive in and make small things is also challenging. You have to kind of ease into it a little bit, but it's a way easier easing in to making small things, I think, than making big things. 
Like it was kind of f funny this morning, just a little quick aside. You know, I, um, Gabe was asking me like, how big are we doing? And I was like, oh, you know, like this size. And I'm thinking like, that's pretty big. And he's like, oh, so it's kind of small. And I was like, sure. <laughs> yeah, for you guys here, sure. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Ooh, speaking of which, somebody's wondering how many times you burn yourself. Not as often as you would think at this point. I mean, everybody burns themselves a little bit. Um, and uh, you just kind of get used to it, yeah. you know. And most of the time it's pretty incidental. It's not that often that you, like, burn yourself really badly. Like, usually something really catastrophic has gone wrong. Um, but, yeah, little burns, little cuts lots of times. Like, yeah. just prepping some stuff the other day, like, cut my finger. Like, most of the time at this point, you don't even really aware that that happens. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then another question about uh, what will happen to the work after your residency. So most of this, well, Kristen, the cold worker, is going to do some work on some of these pieces for me, and then they'll be um, sh shipped to me. Most of them are going to get sandblasted and get kind of the iridescent treatment on them. There's one example here that I just brought to kind of um, show people, but then um, there's also, as I said, there's one on display in the, in the gallery, in the museum. And then a question I always like to ask is where you hope glass goes next as an art medium. I'm sorry, what was that? Where does what, glass go next? Glass. Yeah, what, oh. what do we need to do next? God. Just a short question. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, you know, I, I do think there's been like a really nice kind of resurgence, uh, you know, because of Blown Away and in, in the interest in glass and you know, handmade things, and, and also I think the pandemic was a contributor to that too, of people just having an appreciation for things that you can do yourself or, you know, make with your hands, um, you know, that is kind of special versus, you know, things that you can just buy anywhere and anybody will, you know, other people will have the exact same thing. Um, so I, I do feel like the field has really broadened too in terms of both people making you know, functional things to have at home versus sort of sculptural or unique pieces that might be on exhibition in galleries or museums and stuff like that. There's also this big, in, you know, a, a younger people are much more into, um, you know, videos and, uh, you know, filming and the performative aspect of glass blowing as well. And I feel like there's some interesting work that's coming out of those kinds of explorations, um, even you know, sort of social practice kind of work or things that are somehow interactive or, you know, we've got the capacity at my school, people can put on a virtual reality headset and pretend to like blow glass or throw ceramics on a wheel and stuff like that. So I feel like there's all this terrain with new technology that is starting to kind of infiltrate like this like super old technology, you know, that hasn't really changed in like 2000 years. So that's kind of interesting. I was waiting for a blown away question to trickle in. I have one for you. Um, the question is, do you have a favorite piece or challenge from blown away? Oh, gosh. Um, favorite piece or challenge? You know, I'll have, I, there, I have two favorite challenges. And one is actually usually like the first one, which is just in some way or another, like tell us about yourself. So it kind of introduces everybody to the audience. Um, you know, they kind of phrase it in different ways, but um, so that I feel like is kind of always enlightening and really kind of open-ended and people go in like lots of different directions with that. And then, but I also like the challenges that are more kind of straight ahead, like, you know, make a decanter or, you know, make a set of drinking glasses or something like that, because those, maybe not so conceptual, but definitely like very skill-based, um, but also equally kind of revealing too, like how people kind of approach those things. Great. We have uh, two questions. Is there anybody out in the audience? If not, we'll, we'll wrap it up with these last two nice ones. Um, other than being here today, and I love that you included that uh, person from the 253, what is the favorite moment in your career? Other than right now. <laughs> <laughs> so my next favorite moment. Your next favorite moment. Um, oh. You know, a few years ago, I was um, honored by the Pilchuck Glass School with the Lebensky Brichtova Award which is kind of voted on by, by, by my peers, basically, glass artists and um, 
of all stripes, and uh, they give it to people for their contributions to education in the field. And I was like just overcome with um, how uh, thankful and, and grateful I was for that. I really didn't think um, people were like paying attention <laughs> that much. Um, and you know, I just also feel like I was just kind of doing what I was doing. Like I wasn't really trying to like win any awards or anything. So that was, um, yeah, that was pretty great. Uh, and then uh, was there a particular moment or piece that made you think, yep, this is what I want to do forever? Oh, um, gosh, that would have, have to have been a long time ago now. <laughs> uh, maybe the first time I did like a reticello thing, you know, which is this particular technique of like crisscross canes with like little air bubbles in between them. If you've seen the show Blown Away, Yanush did Reticello in season one. And um, uh, the, the first, one of the earlier times that I tried it and it turned out really well, I was like, wow, this is, you know, I think also it just sort of made me realize like, wow, I've got like skills that I didn't think I had at that point. It was kind of an affirmation of that. And so I sort of thought, well, I'm in too deep now. I'd better want to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> and then our last question to wrap it up, what are you making this afternoon? Uh, so variations on what we were making this morning. Um, we were making some cylinders that I would use um, this, like really hot torch in like one area to kind of make this sort of weak spot. We're going to do something similar but with cones and instead of kind of twisting and um, it's actually this next image on the, yeah there we go, that's what we're going to do. So these cones that are closed off on both ends with just little, little tiny holes and then sucked in um, torched and sucked in to kind of make, a, you know, the essence of kind of a bowl shape. And again, this is going to get the iridescent coating on them. So. Thank you. And, and thank you on behalf of everybody here. Uh, let's give Kathy a round of applause. It's been such a pleasure this week. Thank you all so much. It's really great to see so many of you here. And we all appreciate your enthusiasm and support. And Thank then you. we're going to take a quick lunch break, uh, and the team will be back uh, working in the hot shop about, oh, 2.15 or so. So uh, enjoy the galleries, uh, and thank you guys so much for being here. We'll see you next time.